So there's like two problems in 1.1. 1. 1. one of them, it's like problem four or five. I don't remember for sure. Um, it has like a lot of parentheses and brackets. We didn't actually do one that had that many parentheses and brackets. Um, technically, what you do is you work at the, the parentheses that'll be the most inner ones. And once you solve uh, whatever's happening there, then you would like do the distribution. I have an example because someone asked me because I didn't cover it in class. So if we have time, I'll throw it up here on the board. Um, it basically is just like using multiple parentheses, but to be proper, you can't do like open parenthesis, open parenthesis. Um, you like alternate between parentheses and brackets. Okay, so I can do that, especially if y'all have an issue with it. I can do it like right when class is over and I can show you. Then there's another problem on there that has fractions, which we hadn't done yet because that technically should be a problem that's in 1.6 whenever we actually deal with rational equations. There's no reason why it should be in 1.1. So I don't know, has 1.1 closed yet? It hasn't, right? Okay, if there's those two problems that I literally have not specifically like explained and done an example and y'all can't do them on the homework, don't worry about it. Okay, like I can go in and edit your grade to make sure that you can get the 100. But I'm more concerned about 1.6 when we do those types of fractions um, in those equations that it's more important then. Okay, so there's those two problems in there. If you can't do them at home in 1.1, um, you could just let me know. But like, don't think that, you know, it's a bad thing or anything. I literally haven't done an example that are exactly like that. So that's why I don't expect you to be able to, but if you can, then you're ahead of the game. Okay, today what we're gonna do is we're gonna start 1.3. We need to start 1.3 and, and end 1.3 because we are kind of behind because of day one. Um, and I've been going slow. Um, kind of think what will end up happening is our review day, which is the fifth, I believe. Um, I'll have to finish whatever material we have and then I can answer questions for the rest of the day. Uh, and then the exam is two weeks from today, right, Isaac? Not next week, but the next week. Okay. Um, and the exam will be 20 questions, five points a piece. Uh, all of our exams, I think, are going to be just like that. Okay. That way, nothing carries more weight than any other problem. Okay. So we can go get started. It's 1.3. Let me, can I see the rest of your notes, Maria? Because then we kind of start it. Uh, we did the okay fundamental theorem of arithmetic. So this is just 1.3 continued. Um, I'm just going to kind of rewrite 1.3 on here. Uh, why is it not like zoomed in and stuff? I am cleverly disguised as an adult, y'all. Okay, now it should. Okay, that's a little bit better. Yeah, ready. So 1.3 is complex numbers, which technically um, you use or you have that imaginary unit if you have that negative underneath the square root. Okay, There is a longer process if you do get confused when you do your homework and you do view an example or help me solve this. It's going to show you in a different way. Um, and so in my mind, I just think anytime you see that negative under the square root, just do the arrow. Just tell yourself you're literally pulling that negative out of the square root and it is changing form and it is becoming that little I. OK, um, and if you do want to learn the way it shows you on the homework, I can help you, but it just gets complicated. OK, so I'm just going to rewrite the title here so that I can send this to anybody if they were to need it. Um, what we're going to do. We uh, did an example of like what it means to use prime factorization because our calculators won't actually do it in proper form for us. So now we're just gonna start doing examples. Hey, good morning. Yeah. So we're going to just kind of uh, work on or like evaluate them. Then we need to multiply them. Then we need to divide them. Then we need to add them and subtract them. We're gonna do all kinds of operations on these types of numbers, okay? All right. So the first thing that we have is we're going to write the number as a product, is it a bad delay? No, okay, good. Write the number as a product of a real number and I. It doesn't tell you this and it kind of can be confusing, but they want this part of standard form. Okay, the B is just any real number, whatever number we end up having. Product means that things are being multiplied. So if it says write it as a product, so things are multiplying as a real number, that's that B, and then um, with I as well. 
So that's going to kind of be the form that we have. And then we're going to do two examples. Okay, for the first example. And what we have is if we were to do the square root of a negative. This one is super easy, just so you understand the concept of what's happening. If you have your calculators, it's fine. If not, I think everyone might just be able to do this by um, inspection. Uh, I noticed there's a square root. I noticed there is the negative under the square root. What we have learned is if you see that, we're going to actually pull the I out. Okay, so we're gonna pull. That sounds so weird. Pull your eye out. Okay, pull it out. That occurs because we have the negative underneath the square root. That's step one. Okay, always step one. You see that negative? You don't even have to do the arrow, y'all, but lose your negative and turn it into an eye. Okay, that's step one. So I'm kind of just doing it in the little arrow form right here. I would have the I square root 64. Okay, because I actually pulled that negative out from the square root, giving us our imaginary unit, okay? So then the second like step that we would take is to either factor this number underneath the radical is what that square root can be called, or you can actually just take the square root. You can't take the square root of all numbers, right? Because not everything's a perfect square. If it was the square root of 16, and I use my calculator, or if I just remembered, it would be four, right? Because four times four is 16. Square root of 25 is five. Square root of 64 is just eight. It is a perfect square. If you use your calculator, you get a whole number, that's your answer, okay? So right here, I'm gonna say factor or take square root. I'm lazy, SQ period, RT period. Take the square root. This one is a square root. There's no reason to go to the side and do prime factorization because that's gonna end up being what could be confusing for some of these numbers. This one, I know, I use my calculator or I just know that the square root of 64 is eight, right? So if I take the square root of 64, I get eight. This though right here, written in that form, it's down at the bottom, y'all, but it says I and then eight. That's not proper. You wanna flip that. I, that imaginary unit um, is acted on as a variable. You would never write X two, right? You would write two X. So just change it to where your I is in the, the, like the right side. And that right there ends up being your answer. So the only difference with this and the other things that we've seen before is we have that negative underneath the square root. This one, fairly simple, pull the I out, perfect square, just take it square root, right? You end up getting eight, you're done. Now let's do one where it's not a perfect square and they throw in a couple of different looking negatives on us, okay? So for example, two, say we had negative, you start with that negative sign and then now do your square root of, do another negative sign inside of the square root and then write 20. So this is negative square roots of negative 20, okay? The negative on the outside is gonna stay the negative on the outside. What I see, my first step is to pull out that I, okay? So I'm gonna, I have to like block things with this marker, but I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna show myself, what I'm fixing to do is pull this I out, okay? So what you do is you keep the negative that was originally there on the outside. That wasn't underneath, right? So that kind of like stands alone by itself. So that'll still be written down and then we'll write the I. So it's gonna look like this square root 20. And then, and y'all don't have to, because I'm like, I'm telling it to you and there's no reason to, but if y'all do have questions, y'all can ask me. If you grab your calculator, it's actually gonna be the second button and then the X squared button give you a radical, right? So if you do that, and you put 20 into it and you hit enter, it's gonna give you a decimal. That means it's not a perfect square. When it's not a perfect square, we actually need to do the factorization to see if there is 
um, a set of numbers that can be pulled out of the square root, and then what is it that needs to stay under the square root? So this is where that prime factorization comes to play. Okay, so if we kind of go to the side and we write our 20 and we use prime factorization. Because it's even, I'm gonna do prime factorization and I'm gonna begin with the number two because my goal is to continue to divide it over and over again by prime numbers until all I have is prime numbers, right? So if I divide 20 by two, on the left-hand side, that's where I always put my prime. On the right-hand side, it's like, what do I get when I take 20 and I divide it by two? 20 divided by two is 10. On the left-hand side, that two, you're done, it's prime. Okay, you're like, you no longer need to work with that, do any other uh, type of work on it at all. You look at your 10, 10 is even. So I'm gonna divide it by two. And then when I divide 10, and this is all from what we did the last class, y'all. When I divide 10 by two, what I get for a quotient or an answer is five. The answer is yes. Is five prime? Yeah. So I'm done, right? I've literally, and I don't need this, I don't need that. Those have been broken apart. So the only things I care about is the two, the two, and the five. If I do two times two, I get four. Four times five is 20. So do you see how it was a number 20, but I rewrote it as nothing but prime numbers all multiplying themselves, okay? So this is where, uh, if you, you don't have to, but in the notes, we had said that because it's a square root, we would start looking for groups that had two numbers in them, like so size two. And if that happened, we would have one representative that would actually be able to come out. I, I don't remember the last time I did this. Y'all know I didn't go to high school. I dropped out in like eighth grade. It was like maybe sixth grade when you learn very similar steps to this. They would say that if you have a friend, right, you get to leave the house. And so these twos, there's two of them. One of them can leave the house. And so you could kind of do this, this five. Hold on, let me do something else because that's different than what I usually do. What I'll always do is kind of square them. Okay, this means that I can have a to come out, the five that's being circled is gonna stay underneath the house. Okay, so let me just kind of write what I've said to see if it makes any sense. I've got the negative, a pair of numbers means one of them can come out, okay? And so this is saying I have one to come out. Personally, I'm gonna go ahead and write the two in front of the I, and then that five, did not have a friend, it cannot leave the house, it's going to stay underneath the radical. And that ends up being your completely simplified answer. Okay, so it was a number that wasn't a perfect square root, I needed to factor it myself, and then anything that had a friend, you could actually take one of them out, and anything that was alone stayed underneath the house. Okay, and we're going to see this a couple of times, so we'll be able to do this over and over and over again. Okay, <laughs> I kind of wrote something. Let me kind of write what I've been writing and then y'all can put it here. I like a little note. Uh, I have pairs of the same value. Means you. So pairs of the same value, right? That was the two and the two pairs, meaning it's two of them, right? Pairs of the same value means you can pull out. Um, only one comes out. I'm having to smush my words there. Sorry, y'all. Okay. Let's do this one. And then I think I have like a handful of examples from the homework. Nope. Uh, it's, it's just a lot of different things. Let's just kind of continue. Okay, so if we talk about needing to multiply complex numbers, let's do an example. 
because I think doing the example is going to be easier than first showing you like all of these exponent rules. Y'all say something if you don't get something, okay? So what we did a second ago was just kind of simplify. We just kind of evaluated it. There wasn't really an operation. It was just use the, what you know about imaginary numbers and then just get it to the simplest form as possible. Okay, here we're actually gonna have multiple um, radicals multiplying each other. And it could look something like this. If we have the square root of negative 12, and we multiply, I'm gonna do just like a, a dot. You could do parentheses. I think on the homework they might do dots. And we're gonna multiply this to the square root of negative three. Because I have this multiplicative symbol and I know that it's telling me to multiply them and then I see the negatives inside of the radical, my first step is to pull the negatives out and they become I. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm sure Isaac is like, what did you just do? There we go. <clears throat> so now after I've pulled those negatives out and they become imaginary units, I have I square roots of 12 times I square roots of three. <clears throat> I'm just gonna give you a heads up. If you see the multiplication symbol, 100% of the time, do what I'm gonna do. Don't go to the side now and start trying to do that prime factorization because if you do the three, three is what? Three is prime. Yeah. So if you did do that and y'all don't write this, it's the only two things that can uh, divide it. It's the only two. Do you see how you don't get anywhere? Right. And so if you know that you see that and you know that you can't actually factor that into something else, what it wants you to do. And like I said, nine times out of 10, let me see if I can get this to disappear. It's wanting you to multiply the numbers underneath the square root together, kind of like instead of having two square roots, make it one square root. And I'm going to do it and then I'll show you the rule. I just want to show you the rule first and then anybody give up on me. But um, I know that if I take three to the side and I factor it, I'm going down a rabbit hole and it's I'm not doing anything. Right. So, OK, hold on. What if I multiply the 12 and the three together by like smushing the two square roots together and then see, can I then take the square root of that or factor that? OK, so what we would end up doing, the way it ends up looking is you're going to multiply the eyes together. They're actually going to be I times I which is I, does anybody know? Squared, like that. And then we're going to take, what is underneath the square root and we're gonna multiply them together inside of one big square root, okay? And I'm gonna do this so I can actually simplify it. And if I do that, it's going to actually end up looking like take, and I can do the whole step right here. Okay, you're going to take the 12 and you multiply it to the three. This is because three is prime and I cannot factor it. Okay, so let me multiply both of these numbers together. And if I do that, I have, does anybody remember the, the fact about what I squared actually equals? So like negative one or something, right? Yeah. So if I look at this now, every step I'm reevaluating, I squared is equal to negative one. So this is using the note or using the fact I squared equals negative one. This is what we did the other day. So I just did that there. I changed that. And then I have, does anybody know what 12 times three is? Yep. And then I don't like ones in multiplication because you don't really need them. This is technically just negative square roots of 36. But what is the square root of 36? Six. Six times six is 36. But you would grab your calculator. You can see that, okay? And I do my calculator. I'll show you how to do the square root before we leave. 
So I would have negative six. That ends up being your final answer. So this one actually simplified. And the reason why Isaac, he's like, hold on a minute, wait, because I did have that I squared, right? Mm -hmm. But I squared is the exact same thing is equal to negative one. So like I used that fact and I just changed it. Okay. Um, say you didn't, Isaac, let's see if someone was to go this route instead. Say you didn't do anything to it just yet. You would end up having something like this. Right. And then hold on. You would end up having this right here. But then whenever you would put it into your calculator or your the my math lab, it would probably tell you that you're you're close to the correct answer, but it's not simplified all the way. Right. And the reason is because your correct answer is negative six. And that's because if you change this using that rule, you would end up getting six times what? Negative one, which is what? Negative six. And so it's just because there is just a rule that negative one is the exact same thing as I squared, but to be proper, you always wanna turn your I squareds into negative ones. And y'all, I keep talking about this, and I don't know if y'all remember, but remember the square root of negative one equals the imaginary unit. That's why we have the ability to pull out that negative um, and it turns into the I. And then if you ever see I squared, always rewrite it as negative one, okay? Those are just the two different things that I said, make sure you have on your note card for the exam, okay? A negative under the radical always turns into I. And if you ever have like I times I, you get I squared. As soon as you write I squared, the next line of work, change it to a negative one, okay? I wanna say like an answer is not proper if it's written in the I squared. They want it to turn into the negative one, okay? So, y'all, we can get through this. I can open up y'all's homework. That'd be really cool to do a homework problem with y'all. Okay, what is this? We just did that one. Oh, let me write the rule. And not everybody loves rules and not everybody wants rules, but I'm gonna show you the rule. So if this is what we did a second ago. We had a radical with something underneath it. And it was being multiplied to another radical that also had something underneath it. And because I couldn't factor that three, that three was prime and I could not have gone to the side and simplified it. What I can do is create a bigger radical and multiply those values underneath. And then it turned into 36. You see how then I was able to actually evaluate it and I was actually able to solve it instead of having that three that's prime that I can't do prime factorization on. That was the rule. And there's rules for all of these different things. But we'll see if we can't work on it first. Okay. So let's do one where we divide. Okay. It's kind of the exact same I thought, uh, I can't even talk, same train of thought with the multiplication. If you have radicals multiplying and you can't simplify on your own, combine them together, and then you'll notice it simplifies much easier. If you see that radicals are dividing each other and they're not perfect squares and you really can't simplify them on your own, there's a rule where you can create one big fraction under one big radical instead of having two little ones. It's the same thing as two here becoming one big one and then two here and then becoming one big looking fraction. Okay, so let's do the example first and then I'll show you all the rule. If I do have a fraction and in the numerator, it is the square root of negative 189 divided by the square root of 63. Apparently my friends are awake now. So we will not be quiet. Okay. Oh, 
I say, do you have your calculator? Like that way I could probably tell you to do it or somebody else could do it or if y'all do have it. Um, I have mine too, but I think it'd be helpful. I wasn't the only one up here like, and this is what you get. Okay, so the first thing I noticed, obviously I'm in 1.3, I'm working with complex numbers. I see the negative underneath the square root. I know immediately I'm just gonna rewrite this problem because I'm about to pull out this eye. Okay, um, I'm gonna kind of get a little bit smaller like this. Let's see, we can't do that. Okay, so if I'm, I know for a fact I'm fixing to pull this I out of the numerator of that radical. Um, what I end up getting is negative, I'm sorry, negative Jennifer vertical, I square root 189 over the square root of 63. And then I would just immediately, I'm probably gonna have to show y'all the rule first for it to make sense. And if you ever see division of just one radical over another radical, just immediately do this step. And it should just always work out for you instead of me showing you the three different ways it could. And then you're having to go through all of them, okay? The rule just states that if we have a radical divided by, another radical it doesn't matter if they're the same value on the inside what we can do to solve it easier is create one bigger radical with the fraction on the inside we're actually going to do this then we'll use our calculator and then you'll see how um it's either that y'all or you go to the side and you start factoring 189 and then you notice that nothing makes any sense and then you get lost. Um, okay, Isaac, so you're fixing to do this for us. We have I and then our big fraction, it's covered by that bigger radical, 189 divided by 63. Okay, now do 189 divided by 63. You should just get three. So we have the I on the outside, the radical, and then we have the number three. I'm gonna use my calculator. Let me see something really quick. That should be the simplest way to do it. 189 divided by three, 63 divided by three, 21. So three, 21, seven, three, three, seven. So I three square roots of seven. Okay. I like this way better. I can show you the other way, but you end up having to do a lot of factorization where you have that whole little factor tree and then you're pulling things out, All right? This way I just think is easier, okay? So if you see of the fraction with two um, individual radicals, create one big one. There might be one or two problems on the, um, on the homework. Okay. That's it. We have two different ones that we need to do. And then I'm going to, I need to show y'all something that's called, um, it's like the powers of I and what happens whenever you actually start like uh, really working. Let me see. I don't want to say it wrong. Uh, with what's called the, the conjugate and our imaginary numbers. Okay, so let me just kind of hide this. Okay, so what they want us to do is write in standard form I remember how many homework problems there are. Okay. So say we have a large fraction bar and in the numerator, it says negative three plus the square root of negative 27 divided by three. Okay. 
Like instead of going super in depth into every single problem, there's just a lot of like 10 different types of, I don't know if you would say not really topics per se, but like, yeah, probably topics in this one um, section. And so I'm trying to just cover all of them as much as we can, as fast as we can. And then I want to open up the homework so that you all can see it. Okay. Right here, this is standard form. Standard form is A plus B, I. Well, I noticed that I have a fraction and they want me to write it in the standard form. And so what I would do first and foremost is rewrite what they've given me, but I'm gonna pull out that negative and I'm going to make it an I. So I have my larger fraction bar, negative three plus I square root of 27 divided by three. So let's say this here. Okay, so you can say pull I out. Okay, and then the second step once, oh, I touched the keyboard, sorry. No. The second step, once you actually pull that I out and you kind of rewrite it, is we're going to separate this fraction. So instead of it being one large fraction with two things on the top and one thing on the bottom, we're gonna separate it to where this is one fraction and then this is another fraction, okay? So I'm gonna say separate fractions. They're able to do this because they share the same denominator. Anybody was wondering, okay, the, the two fractions we're fixing to write them as because they both have three in the bottom. That's why in math, you can smush it together and just write it as one big one. Okay, so if I do that, what I have is negative three over three. And then we have that plus sign. And then in the numerator of the next fraction, I have I square roots of 27 divided by three. <clears throat> okay, and now what we're going to do is simplify fractions. On the left-hand side, I have three divided by three is one. There's one negative sign, so it's just a negative one like this. And then I have my plus sign. And then when I look at the second fraction, this is like the first and second example we've done today. There's not another radical multiplying it. There's not another radical dividing it. What it is is just a radical by itself. I grab my calculator. Um, do if y'all have y'all's, uh, I can see if I can't pull this up really quick. I'll probably end up losing the Zoom stuff, but let's do this. I noticed that I have one radical and it wants me to simplify it, right? So I don't know what this means. <clears throat> hmm, that might help. Right, Isaac. Sometimes having things turned on helps for them to work. Maybe, who knows? Um, so I know that I saw like the negative, so I pulled out the, there we go, the imaginary unit. Mm -hmm. Okay, so on my calculator, and mine looks slightly different just because the screen's smaller so we could see more, but the buttons should be like almost 99% the same. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I just turned it off. Okay, the second button is the very top left button. And then there's the number seven. Next to that, to the left is the word log. Right above that, it should say X squared. Touching like the actual plastic of the calculator in the background, it should kind of look like a little radical. So I wanna do that. This was me just kind of showing y'all. If you do second X squared, it creates the radical for you. I'm trying to simplify this. I put 27 in here. I hit enter, I get a decimal. 
That means it's not a perfect square. I need to go to the side and do the prime factorization. Okay, earlier, <coughs> when we had the 64, <clears throat> if I did second square root 64, do you see I get a whole number? Yes, it's a perfect square. That's your answer. Decimal means you factored on your own. Okay, so I'm trying to simplify this. I know that the first, did you get it? Yeah, I know that the first step was always, I'm gonna pull that I out. Okay, then I'm gonna separate the fractions. Then I'm gonna simplify the fractions. Three divided by three, that's one, I get that. This one right here, I grab my calculator. It's not a perfect square. So I'm gonna go to the side and I'm going to take 27. And I'm actually going to see that 27 is divisible. So oh, there's a trick, seven plus two is nine and nine is divisible by three. So that's how I know, but that's something else. That's contemporary math. Okay, you could grab your calculator. And I'm going to go through the prime numbers. It's not even. Let's say I did divide it by two. It's a decimal. I can't do that. Okay, the next prime number would be three. And then I get nine. Whole number means that's good. I can do that. Three and nine. I'm done with the three, right? But, oh, sorry. I got to switch back to this. Oh, I wonder if I can do this. What? Is that too far away? Is that okay? Heck yeah. Okay, so the three is prime, it's done. The nine, that's not prime, it can actually be divided by three. And nine divided by three is three. And then now I'm at the step where, because it's a square root, I can look at pairs, right? I'm gonna, if I see two threes, I'm gonna put a square around them. That means one of them can come out. Okay, this other three can't come out because it's by itself. So I'm gonna do this. This is a pair of threes. This means a three can come out. This one right here by its lonesome is going to stay up underneath the house by itself. So let me rewrite this fraction over here on the right hand side using what we just did. Okay, I know I have the fraction bar. I know I have that I. Uh, this three is going to come out. It's actually going to be in front of that I, right? Because I's it's looked at like an X or a Y or a Z. It's looked at just like a variable. And then this right here has to stay underneath the house because it was alone. So I do square root of three. And then this is all being divided by three. Still not completely done simplifying it, honestly. This one right here would have a lot of threes everywhere because you'd probably think that all of the threes would cancel. And you can only cancel like an actual coefficient or a number on the outside of the radical. Okay, you cannot say, oh, these go away. You cannot do that because one's in a radical and one is not. And that would technically be like you're trying to divide, which we did an example of that. And they both need to be in radicals for that to happen, right? Here, I know those can actually divide. And three divided by three is just the one. So the only thing I'm going to end up having for my completely simplified answer is going to be this negative one in the front. And then plus, I have i square roots of three, but because i's acted on like a variable, it's going to go to the back. I think on the homework, it don't matter where you put it. I, I don't even care where you put it. Okay, we're just going to literally write it this way because I'm going to tell you that's how it should be written. But even if you wrote negative one plus i square roots of three, multiplication is commutative. Two times three is the same thing as three times two. However you write it is fine. Okay, but this would be woo, like the more proper way. Okay, let me see what else. I'm trying to do one of every single type of example in your homework. So if you see one, it's like evaluate or solve. Either it's a perfect square, it's going to have negative, pull out what you need to. You can use your calculator or you have to factor it yourself. You simplify it. If you see that they're multiplying each other, um, I would always create that bigger square root, multiply them, and then see. Um, if you need to go to the side and factor it, or if it's a perfect square root. If you see them dividing, I would create that bigger square root and then kind of just work on them the way that you can um, with your calculator or factor it. And then if it says to rewrite in standard form, it's going to kind of look like the answer to a quadratic equation, which is what we do next in 1.4. I know, you know, they're my favorite. And so the thing is, you have like a big fraction with a lot on the top. It's technically two things in the numerator, one thing in the denominator. 
do what we said. So what I do always is I rewrite it, having that I pulled out so I don't forget it. Then I'm going to separate the fractions and then you can simplify the left-hand side usually pretty easily. It's the right-hand side that's going to have that radical. And then I need to know, can it, it actually be a perfect square and it just changes and the square root falls off? Or is it not a perfect square? I need to factor it. And when I do that, nine times out of 10, that perfect, I'm mean, sorry, that radical doesn't fall off. And then just kind of see what can cancel and then write it um, in, if y'all notice this right here, that's your A. Y'all are the only class this lags for, I don't know why. It's gotta be like everybody's doing something right now. Okay, and that right there, that's what? That's B, ah. So we just took something that was like a bigger fraction with multiple things in the numerator, simplified it by pulling it apart and doing what we needed to. And we've written it now in standard form with a value with no I. And then at the end, it's a value, right? Just a numerical real number with an I attached to it. Okay. And then that right there, it's a B in your answer. Okay. Because the classroom hates me. Okay. It might take a second to turn back on. Um, I think the the rewriting could be like legit, like it can be confusing. Um, the division can too, if you think that you need a factor on both, there is a way, but sometimes that creates more work for you. If you have the ability just to put them underneath one square root, I would do that. Um, this one's last. I don't really know why it would be last. It should be the easier of the different, we're gonna probably have to hop back onto the, what's it called it? Which is just right here. Um, it should be the easier, uh, different versions of these problems, but because it does kind of have um, some distribution in it and like the signs change, I've noticed that it ends up being more complicated. So let's do this example. And then I will have some time to actually talk to you about the powers of I. Okay, so what we're going to call this, um, what we're going to do now is just like combine complex numbers. This is like what we went over on day one. When I say like where it's a combination of terms, um, it's like going to be what we said as far as if the signs are the same, you just add the values and you keep their sign. If the signs are different, you subtract and then you keep the sign of the larger, okay? And so the example that we have here, I keep writing the number one and then I just keep the one example just because I see it on my notes. Okay, so we're going to open, right? You see they have this thing all the time. We're gonna open parentheses, <clears throat> two plus, Nine I. The only difference from 1.1 and right now is instead of X's, I'm writing I's. Okay, everything's still the same that you could probably could have seen like a similar example in the previous homework. And we're going to close our parentheses. Negative or minus, whatever you want to say there. Open. Negative seven, negative I, close. All it tells me to do is to combine, or it may even say add or subtract the following. Okay? And the thing is, um, some things will be added, some things will be subtracted. Okay, so I think saying like combine them or just solve is a little bit easier. If I work from left to right, I notice that in the first set of parentheses, the two does not have like a variable or an I, and the nine does. Those can't be combined. That will not become 11I. Okay, they're not alike. Same thing we uh, deal with whenever we're dealing with um, like our other variables like X, Y, and Z. So I can't do anything with this right here. At the end, I notice I have a negative sign and then that parenthesis opens, right? There's that invisible one. Something is touching a parenthesis. That means we need to distribute it. And so if I actually distribute, I'm going to multiply to both of those things inside, right? Let me go ahead though. And I'm going to start rewriting and working on this step of distribution by writing everything from left to right. The two plus nine I can't do anything to it. And to be completely honest with you, you don't need those parentheses. There's no reason to have them. Nothing's happening there. You would need them if like this was going on, but that's not going on. 
Okay, so when I start to rewrite, I'm just going to kind of drop one because I can. I get 2 plus 9i. Now I'm at the part of distribution. If I do negative 1, remember, y'all, there's that negative invisible one. If I do negative 1 times negative 7, 1 times 7 is 7. Those signs are the same, so it ends up being a positive 7. Distributing that negative just changes your signs. Whatever's in your parentheses, you'll notice the signs go completely opposite, right? Now do the distribution of that negative one to the negative i. It's like one times i is i. Signs are the same, so it's positive. Now I've done that distribution, and now I can just look through. If you have an i, you can be combined together. If you don't have an i, um, those can be combined together. Okay, but you can't mix things up if they're not alike. So we could do something like this. Let me see. I'm going to just kind of rewrite things. I notice I see a positive 2 and a positive 7. So I know they don't have the I. I'm going to just kind of rewrite them next to each other. And then I notice I have a positive 9 and a positive I. So I'm gonna write them next to each other. Maybe doing this and kind of writing the terms that are alike next to each other. And then the last step will actually be adding or subtracting them instead of looking at them in all different kinds of places. Rewrite it. What does have a variable? What doesn't together? You good, Kelby? Okay. Two plus seven is what? Mm-hmm. And then positive 9i plus i is what? Nine. I heard, hold on, I heard something. I heard 10, who said 10? Yeah, it's 10i, and this is why. Um, multiplication, you're right, Isaac, but with addition, add the numbers, that's like a one, right? Add the numbers and then keep your variable. I have something to eat, take a picture before you leave, okay? And that's your answer. 100% on the review and on the exam, there will be one of these. There's going to be one of as many things as I have to put on there. But I know for a fact there's one of these. And the, I don't know what to call it, the learning outcome that has to be tested is if you understand what to do whenever you see that negative touching the parentheses. Okay, first step, if you see that, distribute. And then all we did right here is like rearrange them. Okay, I found the ones that didn't have variables and I wrote them next to themselves and then the ones that do and then add them up. Okay. And so nine plus 10 I is your final answer. Okay, so this is something that's really important because there's always a handful of them on the exams. Um, whenever we talk about our um, I, I'm going to pull it right here. You don't have to write this yet. But do you remember how whenever we did say that I squared was equal to one? Okay. So I'm sorry, negative one. Yeah, I said something because I'm like, when I start thinking and talking, I do better when I don't think and I just talk. Okay. So, you know, we had said that I squared is equal to negative one. And then if we were to do um, I squared times I, Isaac, this is where you would have the i cubed. Okay, what we'd end up having is negative one times i, and we would get negative i. And then if I did i squared times i squared, I would end up getting i squared times i squared is i to the fourth power. And then what I would have is a positive one. What we don't have written right here is if we had i to the first power is just i and then i to the other power. So if you notice we have all these different ways, I'm going to delete this because this is me just kind of showing you what's fixing to happen, but in a, hopefully in a simpler way. Um, we have all these different powers of i that can be figured out and it goes into a pattern and it kind of loops around for us. So let's write here powers of i. If a homework problem asks you to use the fact that we know i squared equals negative one, 
but it says, what is I to the 75th power? Okay, you're not gonna sit there and do I squared times I squared times I squared. Please don't do that. A lot of people do try to do that, but there's actually a really simpler way that we can do this, okay? Because we know that it does loop, I'm gonna show you what it is that happens. I'm trying to get this to go away. In algebra, it is a fact that anything raised to the zero power equals one, okay? Anything raised. So we're gonna start there and we're going to take our imaginary unit, we're going to raise it to one, and we're gonna state, because it is the truth, that it equals, if I raise it to zero, and we're gonna state that it equals one, okay? And then if we just mess with the different powers, start with zero and then work, work your way. It's one, two, three, four, we're just gonna do that, right? Because that's how we would figure out what I to the 75th power is. So I to the zero is one, I to the one is just I. And then Maria helped me out with that fact that I almost completely messed up that I squared is negative one. And then if we do I cubed, that's what I was trying to show y'all right here. Okay, I cubed would be like I squared times I so negative one times I would get you negative I, okay? And so we have equals to negative I. And then let me erase this right here. And then what happens if I go to I to the fourth power? If I do I to the fourth power, wouldn't that be I squared times I squared? And I squared is negative one. So negative one times negative one is just one. Do you see how it looped back around right here? This is one. Okay. Right here, once we get to i to the fourth power, it actually starts looping around. So all it is is a cycle. Okay, all we need to know because it's a cycle is the raised to the zero power, the first power, the second power, and the third power. Because if we wanted to actually figure out any power of i, we could figure it out just knowing these four right here. And this is what needs to be written on y'all's note card for exam one, okay? So there is a formula that states, if you take any i and you raise it to the nth power, nth just meaning it's going to be any number, okay? It is going to be equal to, it's going to be equal to one if remainder is zero. It's going to be equal to I if remainder is one, negative one if remainder is through two, sorry, two. And then it's going to be negative i if remainder is four. And what that's saying about the remainders is if I ask you what does it end up equaling, if I give you i to the 75th power, there's gonna be a little black step that we need to take we look at our remainder and then I could tell you what it ends up being literally without doing I times 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 Y'all, someone, I don't know who it was, but someone last semester actually did write out like 47 different I's on the exam to figure out what it was. And instead of doing that, like there's an easier way, okay? So I'm gonna show you how, let me zoom out and see. I'm gonna leave this up. I'm just trying to like just move it just slightly. Okay, powers of I, when it's um, asking you what it ends up equaling and your power is just insane. It's 64, it's 49, it's 75, it's 103, whatever it may be. It doesn't matter what the N is because I know that this is cyclic and it actually is on a cycle of four and then it starts repeating. All I have to do is take the exponent that they raise your I to, divide it by four, and then look at that remainder. Whatever your remainder is, that actually tells you 
what it's going to end up being without sitting there multiplying that many eyes together by yourself. Okay. Okay. So let's just kind of start doing examples. I have three of them. Section is like all over the place. <clears throat> the directions I think would just say simplify, right? Because it just wants you to tell me like what happens if you were to simplify this, the power of I. Okay, everyone should I hope have that right there. Okay. So for the first example, if I was to ask you what is I to the 33rd power, I know that there's a lot of these on the homework and there's like a few of these on the review and there's usually like two to four of these on the test, okay? Instead of doing I times I times I, what you do is you are going to take the power that they give you, you're going to divide it by four, I've always written it like that. And then I wrote it in the regular like Euclidean division. Okay. If you want to just write this one right here on the right-hand side, you can. Okay. If I was to do that, I noticed that four times eight is 32. 33 minus 32 is one. This is your remainder. So instead of doing it all by yourself, you took the power. So you take power and divide by four and look at remainder. I took the power and it's always four. It'll always be four. You always divide it by four. The powers will change because it's asking you different questions about different powers, but the four never changes. And where you look never changes. Okay? The remainders will change because it's either going to be zero, one, two, or three. Okay, But you always divide by four. Okay, So if I do this, I get a remainder of one. Therefore, looking at my notes and what I have right there, if I actually take I and I multiply it to itself 33 times, what I'm going to end up getting for an answer using those facts that we wrote is gonna be I. Everybody get that? Because my remainder is one. Okay, let's do another one. Somebody tell me, so I can stop talking and drink a drink of my drink. <laughs> what you get if you simplify <clears throat> I to the 50th power. Mm -hmm. No. What did you say? Almost. Almost. 250 divided by four. Oh, sorry. Five zero. Mm -mm. So I'm going to take my 50 and divide it by four. Four goes into five once. It's four, one, ten. Yep. Four, two is eight. Ten times eight is two. That's my remainder. My remainder is two. That means that my answer is negative one. So, like, that's like old school, like elementary school division right there. Because if you do use your calculator, it does say 2.5. I'm sorry, 2.5. 12.5, which is what it is, um, it actually could lead you in the wrong direction to like know what the remainder is doing that little division by hand. And like those steps, you'll end up getting that remainder right there instead of trying to figure out what your calculator means or what the remainder is. There's another way, but this is the easiest, I promise. Oh, there's another one. I to the 17th power. The remainder, uh, I did the 17th. So we do 17 divided by four. Four times what? Four is 16, right? That gives me a remainder of what? Uh huh. And so then what does it actually end up equaling? Uh huh. 
She said, we just remember how to do that division. And I'm being, I keep on trying to, I want to be professional. I keep on saying things in my head that I want to say out loud and I can't. I'm being dead serious okay? uh, to like utilize the little three by five note card as much as you can. Um, all you would really, hold on, let me write this down now. My laptop is hot. You could probably get away with just the right hand side. Um, I mean, as a class, if y'all are like, hey, I want that much room on my note card for something else, I'll write this on the board. Yeah, I just, I mean, like, I need to know what you want me to do because I do not mind at all with y'all having that. But it is also just remembering to, like, I need to have the steps of, um, doing that division by hand, right? To get that actual remainder. And then I can look at my notes and be like, okay, if remainder's two, then my answer is negative one, okay? Okay, y'all, so I've got two more things that I believe finishes it. Um, and it's the last one that's a doozy. So I've got 13 minutes, let's go. So. We've simplified, we've multiplied multiple radicals together um, and then had our eyes and then we had the division and then we had where we just had terms. Some had eyes, some didn't have eyes. Oh, my allergies are going And um, like we combine them together to the powers of I. Now what we're gonna do is like really kind of, cause we started on the powers of I um, first or like in the middle of everything before we did this type of multiplication because the beginning of the work is really kind of looking at those imaginary units um, and how they get pulled out of radicals. Now we're like working on them. Um, if we were to multiply, keeping in mind the fact that I squared equals negative one and a proper answer will never have I squared in it. Okay, it'll always be changed to negative one. Okay. So if we were to see something and it pulled us to, okay, open your parentheses and do nine minus seven I close square. My eyes are hurting so bad, y'all. So if you see something like this, what it wants us to do is actually make a copy of those parentheses. Okay, so we're going to actually open nine minus seven I close open nine minus seven I close. The first line might exist on some problems. It's the second line that I would believe you would see, but they both mean the same thing. One is an expanded version, the second one, right? Because they expanded it out and they're showing you everything. And then the first one's what we called a condensed version because they've made it shorter or smaller or easier. Um, and then by putting that square, that means that originally there was two of them, okay? But if it's wanting me to actually uh, multiply these together, then what it wants me to do is called foil. Does anybody remember that? Yes, Jennifer, I do it in my sleep. First, outer, inner, last. We're gonna take the first terms of both parentheses and multiply them together. And then the outside terms, which is the first and the very last, and multiply them together. And then the inside terms, which is the second and the third. And then finally, the last ones, um, which is the second and the fourth. Um, but it's gonna look like this. I'm not going to do it just yet. I'm just going to show you. So we multiply these together and then these together and then these together and then these together. Mm -hmm. You can. I'm not even going to lie. I don't even know what that is. But if you, have, if you know the box, do the box. If you know any kind of method at all, when you have binomials multiplying each other, do it. Like, I don't mind at all. It's like going to be that personally, I like to just look at answer blanks. And if it's right, I move on. It's when it's wrong, I'm like, okay, let me go see like where math was broken. But if you give me the right answer, like just I'm fine with that. Um, but yeah, we're just gonna like basically multiply this out in whatever way form you know how, okay? So we do that, we have nine. It's really just the last, 
the ending part that is different than what you may have ever seen before in your life. And it's because of the eyes. Okay, but if we do nine times nine, we get 81. I'm freaking out on time. So I'm just gonna kind of start talking because this last one is literally like kind of hell in a way to explain it. And we might have to do it at the beginning of next class. Nine times nine is 81. Signs are the same, so it's positive. Nine times seven is 63. Signs are different, so it's negative. Don't forget that variable or that I that was on that second term because it's not going to go anywhere. And if you do nine, I'm sorry, seven times nine, you get 63. Signs are different, so it's negative. Don't forget your I. Seven times seven is 49. Signs are the same, so it's positive. And then right here, I times I, same thing as doing like X times X, right? You end up just squaring them or you end up like adding their exponents. So I times I is going to be I squared. But what do we know about I squared that actually equals what, Maria? Get it right? I don't remember my new tattoo. Sorry, it's somewhere in there. Okay, so all they want me to do now is just combine it and like simplify it. Okay, but this has to be kind of shown first because there's like two to three of them in one problem in the next problem. Okay, so I'm kind of like at least showing all this. Okay, so whenever I start combining, I see that I have the 81 up front by itself, no I, it's alone, it stays alone, it just continues to be 81. And then I notice that my middle terms, they are both negative and they are both 63 and they both have an I. Those can be combined together, right? Signs are the same. So what I do is I add them together and I keep their sign. Isaac, just because I think you asked a question earlier. Do you see at the end, when I multiplied the I's, it turned into the square. But when I add them or subtract them, they just stay I's. Okay, so like you do math on the numbers, keep your variable, keep your exponent. And you'll have a bunch of like intermediate algebra videos that um, we could hang out in my office hours and watch, or I could teach you, or I could help you. I was gonna let me know. And then bring down the negative 49 I squared. Someone may see that there's something I could have done there okay, to keep from having to write it again, but I didn't, so let's do this. Okay, I have 81 minus 126 I. I think Jackson told me when I said it, but like a proper, like real, uh, like a good answer that's answered correctly. Um, we'll never have the I squared in it whenever you're doing this uh, FOIL part of multiplication. And so if I apply the fact that it actually equals negative one here, don't I have, I have 49 times negative one is actually gonna equal what? A negative 49. And then you look and you see, I kind of just created a numerical value that does not have an I on it. And so those can be combined. Um, if you needed to grab your calculator, you could. These signs are different. So what you would do is you would subtract them and then you would keep the sign of the larger, which would be the 81, which would be positive. And then you have the negative 126i at the end. That is in standard A plus B I form. So FOIL like always, if you not FOIL like always, like I'm telling you to do it, like always, I'm saying like, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as far as working with normal variables, it's very, very the same. Uh, nothing really changes except for whenever you get to the combining like terms, those I squareds become negative ones, okay? I still have five more minutes. Let me figure out if I want to try to do this one problem. I kind of want to just so y'all can see it and have it in your notes, to be completely honest. Um, because I won't see y'all again until Monday. And I think this homework's due. Um, I'm gonna, if there's one that does the conjugate for 1.3 homework, like do everything but that one. Okay. And it'll it should be fairly easy to know, but this is what's happening here. Um So the same way uh, a lot of the answer 
won't have the I squared in them because I squared is equal to negative one and you could easily change it to a negative one to answer it. Um, if you're dealing with an annoying computer that doesn't like you, okay, you will never have, oh yay, a proper answer will never have um, an I in the denominator. Right, so it starts like this, just the black six plus I minus, I'm sorry, over six minus I, okay? This right here, I can't have the I in the bottom. So the purple, right, I'm gonna multiply by the conjugate. And there's like this whole step in process. And then that foil that we just did to foil things out, and what ends up happening is I no longer have that imaginary unit in my denominator. And then I just simplify it and I end up having the answer done. Okay, so if you see one, it says something about the word conjugate or you see an I in the denominator, don't worry about that one for now, but do all of the other ones. Okay, go ahead and go, unless you have questions. Tell me, did you do the box method? Was it the exact same, like it worked out and everything? Yeah, what is the box method? <laughs> There was a, I think that might have been the same method uh, I heard people talk about last time, but I didn't know what I know. You know what I mean? I think that I remember the Okay, no, not. Well, I heard that. Okay, so three X would go here, and then minus five would go here. And then you know, you need like to go away. Minus and that's, so that's a two step. We have a three step. We will have the middle number. Right, and then but what we had to like we had the variable here or the eyes here, so they would go here and you can see it gets squared, and then you can just do that it's a negative one. Like that, I actually look a little easier. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Yes. Did you ever figure out um not how to work it? Uh which of which one was it? Um it was in the cocoa. Like, we, we haven't done any chapter three stuff. Like 1.1 and 1.3. I think I did email you today. Um something about how it looked like it was okay on my end. Do you mind if I pulled it up? Yes. Actually, I don't even know if it has my my stuff save to be honest. So where do you guys get your calculator? Uh the bookstore. Yeah. Um, and then like if you were to need yours before you got it, um, I do have mine most of the times so that you could use as well. Okay. I don't know if it's gonna have my stuff save thing. Um mom, mom, mom. um uh, Yes, you get a three by five note card. You could write on the front and on the back. You could write any kind of like, uh, like steps or hints to like remember how to solve the problems, like the little bullets I do on the side. So I don't know how to end this. Mm -hmm.